All right, can you guys hear me now? Right, who am I missing? This one here. That was weird. Shanks, Isaac, Jimmy Rotary. Uh, let's, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six. I only got seven here. I think we we got everybody. Where's uh Octavius? Um. I think we need to What's that? Yeah. All right. Uh Does he? Yeah, I think one point. Let's see. All right. So we missing. Okay, so JB's in there twice, so it's one, two, three, four. Yeah, we'll be we'll be done here pretty quick, Brian. We're getting down to the nitty gritty now. All right, I think is Sean is one point three liters of furry, right? Okay, so we're just missing Octavius, which hopefully I posted on the forum. I don't have him on my connections list either for some strange reason. Do you guys happen to know what that guy's forum uh, name was? Octavius? Is it Postnake? Okay. I hate your mouse. Can somebody uh, send him a private message via the AK Club? Yeah, let him know that we uh, we have a new meeting ID. I don't know how often he checks the forum. All right, thank you. Okay, so hopefully he'll 
pop back in. The okay, so we if we are off and our trend is greater or lesser or whatnot, that's going to be indication of a mass airflow sensor scaling issue. If we are off consistently across that whole band, that's an injector one issue. If you're off in one small area, it, either you can ignore it as a one-time thing, you can relog that same RPM and see if it uh, duplicates, right? If you have a trend of it happening more often, you can look at the fuel VE map as, a, as an area that you need to adjust. It just depends on your specific engine situation. So if you've done some heavy internal modifications to your engine, you're going to want to look at the fuel VE as being a potential issue, right? Because if you have uh, a turbocharger, a supercharger, uh, any kind of porting, right, it could be a fuel VE issue. If, if you have a factory RX-8, non-forced induction, leave the VE map alone as it is right now, even for scaling, because Mazda did a reasonably uh, extensive amount of R&D to come up with that particular table. And we all know that logically no engine can be perfectly, have perfect 100% VE in all of its RPM bands, right? That move at different speeds, it's going to have a different volumetric efficiency. So, where if you have forced induction, right, you have to make a modification for the forced induction area. So what I did was I took the VE map and scrunched it down for the non-boosted areas to be very similar to the factory. And then I use one for everything in boost because you don't know what your VE is. You don't know what you have to change yet. You have to log it in those areas and that's part of the fine-tuning process when you go into boost. Any other questions? One, two, three. So I think we're just missing Octavius. Okay, so. Once we have that first band done, okay, then we move to 4,000 RPMs to 6,000 RPMs. Now, what I want you guys to see, and let's see if I can find a good example. All right. Now, does everybody see this column right here? This is the injector pulse width column. Now, notice the injector pulse width in milliseconds, of course, is very small at low RPMs, and then it increases, which is logical, what we expect to have happen. All right. Now, as our RPMs increase and our load increases, all of a sudden our RPM duration or our injector duration drops. What do you think that means? What don't you see, uh, Shax? Oh, you don't... S okay. I will uh, wait for it to catch up then. All right. Does everybody see... Uh, okay. I'll let it finish loading. Okay, so this column right here is our injector duration in milliseconds. As this log is going toward uh, red line, our injector duration increases like we expect it to, and then it drops from 11 to 9. Okay, that's an indication of the secondary injector beginning to open up 
And if you notice, the RP or the uh, duration continues to drop past the 4,000 RPM mark right here, right? Everybody see that? So that's just the transition phase from one injector open to two injectors open. Then as you continue to go down the road, okay, come on. It's going to drop even more. Okay, there, there, there. no. This is five, four. Oh, that's kind of a crazy one. Where did it go back up again? Okay, right here. So the second injector opens here, and we see it start to rise, and then it falls again right here as the third injector opens up. All right, so those are, I'm just showing you the injector transition points. When you do your four to 6,000 RPM log range, one of the things that you want to pay attention to is the injector duration. For example, at 4,000, it should be relatively high. At 4,500, it may or may not be higher than your 4,000 one. By your 5,000, it should, should be definitely lower than the 4,500 or the 4,000 one. That's where you get your indication that the second injector has begun to fire, okay? That makes sense to everybody online? Uh, as far as your question there, Ryan, it, it does not cut to 50% right away because it's a, it's a smooth transition. It's not like they just automatically all start firing. So the duration on the the actual duration, because remember, we, we have multiple durations per injector. It's just that the cob only logs one. Okay? So if you saw, like, the old uh, e-managed days, you actually had th a, a three separate injector durations for each of the injectors, because the e-manage looked at all of them separately. The Cobb being ODP2 only handles one injector, okay? So all you're looking for is just the transition so that you know when the other one is on. So for example, for our four to 6,000 range, we're good at 4,000. We're good at 4,500. We're on target. At 5,000, we are 10% off of our target AFR, and then you look at the injector durations, and you notice that the injector durations go up, up, and then down. That's where your indication is that it's your injector number two that needs to be modified. Okay? If at 5,500 RPMs, it goes back to being good, not injector number two, right? Same rules apply. If an injector is off, it's going to be pretty consistently off for each RPM, okay? But as a general rule, if you see that the injectors are, uh, duration drops and your AFRs are off, it's that injector that needs to be modified, okay? Everybody tracking? Online too? Good to go? So, 4,000 to 6,000, we're looking for injector number two to modify. Or the fuel VE or the mass airflow sensor. All those are still on the table. It just depends on the type of error that you're seeing. Okay? And remember, you have to do the higher RPMs yourself. Okay? Meaning that we have to go through, I'll show you here. We go to our log. On the higher RPMs, let's see if I can find one pretty easily. So 
All right, so this, our 4500 law here. Um, to answer your question, Ryan, it's it's very dependent. His question was the pulse width increasing and the duty cycle staying the same as an indicator that another injector is being turned on. It's a pos it's possible. I don't I don't know for a fact that that it's untrue. Okay, that that can happen. The bigger issue is. The, the ODB2 standard that the COB reads off of is not designed for rotaries. It is not designed to have multiple injectors attached to it. So how it interprets what the engine computer is doing into the ODB2 standard, I don't know. So I'm not sure of any other way to be 100% certain that injector is on other than the injector pulse width dropping down. Okay. It, it is possible, Ryan, that if you have a log where the duty cycle increases and the pulse width stays the same, that another injector is being transitioned into the mix. I just don't know that for a fact. I don't know how the ODB2 standard interprets because it's not designed to read multiple injectors. Um, so now for these higher RPM ones, when you're in open loop, and you'll notice here a couple things to consider for this 4,000 to 6,000 RPM range. We're adjusting injector number two, right, and or the mass airflow sensor if we need to. Also remember that the transition to open loop, as you can see here, sometimes takes a minute, right? So if your log looks like this, where you have some short-term fuel trims, and then all of a sudden it goes into that uh, negative 0.16, okay, what you want to go ahead and do is ignore the closed loop stuff, okay? This, this range right here, just ignore it, okay? So you can just delete it or whatever you want to do, okay? But now, we know we're in open loop, so we go to our calculated load, we get our average. Our average is 33.66%, okay? We go to our RPMs, which is 4,500 RPMs. Then we go to our equivalency ratio, which is 12.5. So we have three numbers, right? 12.5, 4,500, and 33. Then we go to our target AFR map. We find the number closest to 33, closest to 4,500, okay? And we see that we want to be somewhere between 14.3 and 14.01, right? We are actually at 12.5, right? So we can do, let's just say we want to be at 14.1. And we're actually at 12.5. All right. We're approximately 12% rich for this band. Okay, does everybody see that? Make sense to everybody online there? I want to make sure I didn't go too fast for the screen lag. Hey, you guys there? Make sense? Oh, really? Okay. Are you? Is my audio lagging or the video lagging?
Okay. Um, did you see me go into the cob and look at the target AFR table? Okay. Well, if anybody doesn't understand the uh, the gist of it, then I can repeat it. If you want me to redo it, I will repeat it. Just let me know. No, this is the only one that I've got. Okay, so nobody needs for me to repeat it. So we took our target AFR from the target AFR table, which was 14.1, and then we divided the target AFR by the actual AFR from this log, which is 12.5, then we know that our total amount that we need to change is about 12%, right? You guys all got that because you're here. Okay, now you're going to do the same process with each of those logs in an open loop. Okay, what I recommend you guys do is make yourself a little, I usually just end up using a post-it note, a little ma uh, matrix kind of a thing. And it'll look like this. RPM load mass airflow actual AFR target AFR difference. Okay. So for that one, we were at 4,500 RPMs, 33% load roughly. Um, I would go back, what are my mass air approvals? 2.23. Actual was 12.5. Target was 14.1. And then you can just do this full thing. Right. You're going to do one of these for the 4,000, 45, 5,000, 55, and 6,000. Okay. And that will give you your trend. And you can do the same thing for the one to 4,000 ones too. The only difference is those ones you use the fuel trims. You don't actually have to go back and look at the target AFR. Based on the, tre the way that the difference looks tells you what to adjust, right? So you always want to do a trend analysis underneath there, this difference part here. So if that's 12% and that one's 12% and that one's 12% and that one's 12%, we know that it's injector number two. Assuming that your earlier RPM ones are done, right? If you got a 12, an eight, a six, might be a mass airflow issue going on, right? And if you just have some craziness, where it's like zero ten zero zero, that's you know an outlier type of thing. You typically want to relog that area just to make sure you're seeing the right thing. And if it's consistently off like that, then adjust the fuel VE map. And this would be for bank two, Ryan. That is correct. So at the end of the day. I'll actually kind of give you generally speaking it'll look a little something like this when you're done and like I said you could use a post-it note or a piece of graphing paper or Excel if you want to Let's just pretend I did 500 all the way around, right? Okay. 
And then on uh, one point two three two point one two point two one two point two. Now these for the when it's in closed loop, you don't have to worry about these guys, right? Because we don't care. So short-term and long-term are both for the same result rate, right? Correct. Yeah, okay, so to answer your question, Jay Kundi, yes, logging requires a fairly flat road at a fairly consistent speed. Um, right, and Ryan just answered the question for me. The best way to do this is drive down the road, cruise control on, have a nice long straight road somewhere. Um, Get your RPM dialed up to where they need to be, okay? Once you get it dialed up to where they need to be, set it and, and, and set cruise control, count to five. Because remember, every time you touch that throttle or adjust it, it throws your AFR off a little bit. We saw that one where it was closed loop and then it went into open loop. So just wait a good five seconds, then punch the log button. And then you want to get as much data as you possibly can. The goal is about 30 seconds, if possible. Yes. It's a good question. Uh, I would say of the two, it would be better slight incline. If you had to have a hill, be better to go uphill. If it's going downhill, you're going to be coasting, which means that your AFRs will be like whaling. Um, and try to get 30 seconds, if, if humanly possible. Good solid stuff per band. Now, when you do this, don't forget, you're going to do the first chunk first, make adjustments to get it to where you want it to be, then do your chunk number two. Okay? So you're not going to, it's not going to look exactly like mine up there because it, what it should look like at the end of the tuning session is this should be, you know, ideally all those will be zero because you've already covered that and you tuned it and you're good then you're going to have the rest of the RPM bands, right? So with, what's tolerance on shorter fuel trim, say it's like, if it's 0.03, that's uh, amazing, right? Oh, yeah. 0.03 is very amazing. Yeah. The tolerance is 3%. Okay. Plus or minus 3%, and you're statistically speaking perfect. Keep in mind that um, it takes... 10% of an AFR, or 10% more fuel to adjust your AFR by one point, in a general rule, okay? So, if you're aiming for 14.7 and you're getting 13.7, you're about 10% too rich. So, if you're inside 3%, that's like you aiming for 14.7 and you're getting 14.5. Statistically... They're the same, okay? So don't necessarily chase the zero because you'll never get it. Um, I had some pretty close to zero at idle when I was doing, first started doing this process in Virginia, and it's because I'm retardedly anal retentive. So I just, and I, had, and I was trying to refine everything, so I had a plenty of time to play around with the idle. Um, Good question, Jay Cundy. Uh, if you're naturally aspirated and you're not going to use any wide open throttle, I guess that's fine. You can go ahead and leave it, make it a flat AFR table. But really, the lookups don't take all that terribly long. And I fear that 
you may forget to swap your tune back before you go drive it, and you might end up causing some damage because 14.7 or 13.1 is probably going to be too lean for you if you're driving it hard, wide open throttle. So, but it is an option if you really just don't want to have to monkey around with uh, checking the table all the time. Okay, so we did our 4,000 to 6,000, right? Then we're going to do the same thing from 6,000 to 8,500. That's round number three. Yes, Ryan, you are correct. 11.8 to 12.2 is probably your sweet spot without wasting, uh, without being overly aggressive. Okay, so once you've done your 6,000 to 9,000 range, you now have your mass airflow scaled, right? Your injector number one scaled, your injector number two scaled, and your injector number three scaled. Everything should be copacetic at that point. Done. Okay. Now, if this is going to differ based on what you're doing. If you're naturally aspirated, once you scale those sensors, you are ready to do your power tune. Because you know, within reason, that whatever target AFR you give it, it should hit. So now you can go into those target AFR tables and fix the crappy ones that the stock guys did. Stock RX-80 guys. They're a must. <laughs> if you're forced induction, you got to be a little bit more careful than that. You can't just go all into it willy-nilly, okay? So, if there's any... Uh, something's happening. Hey, Kane? Hey, yes? Uh, is the... My screen hasn't updated in a while. I'm not sure where you're at on the visual side of things. Okay, I see your mouse moving now, so is that... Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I haven't I haven't changed the screen in a while. Um, okay, I wasn't sure if I was, I was locked or not. <laughs> gotcha. I'm gonna close Excel right now. Maybe. Come on, you. Whatever. All right. I'm over it. Okay. So, uh, to answer your question, Ryan. Logging a turbocharged, actually, either way, um, you should not be in boost cruising for these logs. Um, maybe on an incline you might be, but I've we've done a lot of tuning and we've never been in boost. Yeah, just make sure you have a light throttle. What you really want to avoid doing is the the driving it like a normal human being, you know what I mean? You put the gas, change gears, all that stuff. Very easy at those higher RPMs to to create boost. Um, so, but if you're just cruising, you, usually you'll never boost. Um, even in this Pettit Supercharger, it didn't boost when we did all those cruise logs. Uh, so, yeah, I guess Featherfoot it would be the short answer to your question, Ryan. And... Also, again, don't drive a forced induction vehicle without a forced induction mat put on it. Right. So you're still doing this exact same process. You just have a, a turbo base map or a supercharger base map loaded. Um, okay, so now you've all got your center scaled in. Whatever. So whatever you put in these target AFR tables is what you should be getting. Okay. Now we already know what rich best torque is, right? And we already know all that kind of stuff. So look at our high-speed factory air fuel table map, particularly in this ish area. Okay, so this is where your power is doing naturally aspirated tuning. Once you scale everything and you're confident that you're going to get the AFRs that you want, Go in here and pretty much everything that's richer than 11.8 needs to be 11.8 or 12.1. You want to be real crazy with it, you can make it all, you know, 
again, to put you closer to the edge. Try not close to the edge you guys want to be. It's your call. You know, you. But we know that 12.1 to 13.1 is our sweet spot, and we know that anything richer than 11.8, 11.7, you're just wasting power. So naturally aspirated is pretty easy as far as tuning goes. Okay. Obviously, if you have force induction, it's a little bit different ball of wax. Now, that being said, that, in a nutshell, is the tuning process for the Cobb access port on the fueling side. Okay? Oh, I have the uh, 07 and 08 access tuner race. So I've only got two fuel maps. You guys will have three, and you'll have a whole bunch more loads, maps, or load blocks. Okay. All right. The next thing we're going to get into is timing. Okay. Does anybody at this point have any questions about the fueling part of this process before we take a break and move on to timing? You guys are all good here in the room. All right, anybody online have a question about fueling? Twelve point one, thirteen point one, rich and lean best torque, right? Yeah, the rich and lean best. The question was 12.1, 13.1 is the difference between rich best torque and lean best torque. That is the range that gives you the most power. What's wrong with being at 13.1? You're just on the edge of... You're just being more aggressive. If you were a NASCAR driver and I was tuning your car, I would tell you to be at 13.1 because that extra 10% of fuel that you're going to save over the course of a 500-mile or 500-lap race, big deal. Street guy who doesn't want to break his engine, I would say probably 12.1 at a minimum, maybe 11.8. Because you, you're you sure that's the premium you're putting in your car? I know it says it on the, yeah. the gas thing, but are you sure about it? Yes, uh, that is one viable option there, uh, Jay Cundy. Anything, again, oh boy, yeah, okay, so what, let's just all kind of slow down for a second. Remember, once we're done all of our cruising, then we make these changes, okay? Then we do our wide open throttle pull and verify that you're hitting the target the AFRs that you want, right? All things being equal, you can you know you make these changes, get everything at 12.5 or whatever. Do a wide open throttle pull, and you're right there where you want to be, and you're good to go. Um, the there's some things that interrupt this acceleration fuel map and some other stuff, which we'll talk about after timing. All the little small nitpicky stuff, but what you don't want to do is put it all at 13.1 because you're going to be a super aggressive guy, and then go nail it because you're not sure you're hitting a 13.1 yet. You want to set it up, make it, yeah, make it more aggressive, and then, yep, slowly move to where you want to be. And for a street car, unless you just are a very aggressive person, I would say 12.1, 12.3 maybe would be my personal comfort zone. Now, I can tell you that between 12 and 13, all day long, you should be good to go based on the physics, but it's not my $7,000 engine that I have to worry about. <laughs> All right, so let me see here. We got some questions. Uh, yes, during watt logging, after you adjust these fuel tables, just keep one eye on the AFRs. Make sure they're not crazy, and as long as they're sitting at that 12, 12.5, 12 
whatever you set it for, you should be pretty good to go. Uh, turbo wise, to answer you, JB, I aim for <coughs> 11, 12, 1, 11, 8 at about 110% load. And I work down from there to about 10, 8, 10, 9, close to the 200% load. And I have base maps that I've made. Uh, they've actually, they're all over the forum, I'm pretty sure. Uh, if not, I can email it to you guys. It's just, the actual AFR piece isn't like rocket science, as you can see. All the work is in doing your scaling. And that's why I always tell people, you want a base map? There you go. There's no secret to it at all. Whether it works for you or not is up to you and luck of the draw. Um, all right, just remind me, JB, and I'll get you those base maps. Um, let's go ahead and, and take a, a quick break. I, I know that uh, Carbon's got to go here pretty soon. Let's take a break, come back, let's do timing, and uh, then we'll do the last small stuff. All right, yeah, we'll do timing, do the last little small bit, and then that way after Ryan punches out, anybody has any additional questions can stick around and we'll do some more hands-on stuff. Sound good to you guys? All right, let's take it five.
Everybody back? All right. <laughs> Just kind of wrap up the rest of this uh, real quick, like. We, we went over, I, I skipped a bunch of slides and stuff we already went over during the exercise. Um, once you start working with those AFRs and stuff like that, keep in mind uh, what's called interpolating. So if you've got the fuel VE map up and you have, let's see here, under the fuel VE map, you need to make a change here here, here, and here. That's what you have the logs for, or those four specific cells. If they're all trending the same, you want to interpolate them, meaning you want to do that whole box at once. Okay? By the same token... Right, it's in the same range. You're not going to be able to get every single cell individually. So if you if you have a, a grouping of cells in an area that all have a similar change that needs to be made to them, just change the whole box. That's fine. It helps make helps you fill the map out a little bit. Yeah, you can change the whole big box all at once if you would like. It's your call. Okay. So that's the interpolating part, and then. Okay, we talked about the wide open throttle tuning. Now, idle tuning for us is what we do first because we have to. We have multiple injectors. On a piston engine, just for in case you ever decide to do one, you do idle last because it's a pain in the butt. Cold start and idle are the hardest ones to tune. Even for us, it, it is, but we just don't mess with it. But you have an idle air control motor and some other stuff with a piston engine that you got to make sure is, is good to go. So you do your cruise first, then you do your watt, and then your uh, idle. And then if you have something that's very radically modified, or you don't have a base map for it, and you have to tune the cold start, this goes mostly for like the FDs, if you use uh, FC Edit or something like that. In order to tune the temperature modifiers for your cold start, you'd actually need it to be all the way cooled down. So you get one shot a day to dial in your cold start, and then you have to let it sit and cool all the way back off. Or you get a chain of nitrogen. Those are your options. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, timing. And I have a separate thing, so I'm going to... Okay, let me minimize this real quick. Don't need that. Okay. All right. Let's talk a little bit about time. All right. Uh, all right, we talked about the general gas law before, right? So what we're talking about here with timing is this is a representation of the temperature. Gosh, this thing's pissing me off. It's like swapping around like crazy. All right. So this is the temperature differential 
based on the pressure differential on an engine as it rotates 360 degrees, okay? So your changes are going to happen very slow, right? From bottom dead center, working your way to top dead center, there's not going to be much change at all. And as you approach top dead center, the changes are going to accelerate, right? And then as you get very close to top dead center, it's going to slow back down again. Okay, that's generally how it works. So, we know that our mechanical advantage is about 12 to 15 degrees after top dead center. It takes a little bit of time for that thing to burn, right? Okay. So, the faster it rotates, the same amount of time is required for it to burn, but the engine is physically moving faster. You have to advance your timing. You have to ignite the event earlier because by the time that little kernel of flame gets into a laminar flame speed, the same amount of time has passed, you know, let's just say it's three milliseconds for sake of argument, your engine will have rotated much farther during that time. So that's why we advance timing. All right. Now, the higher the engine's load is, the more O2 is in the combustion chamber, the faster it burns. So it's a little bit of a catch-22. For higher RPMs, you want to advance, and for higher loads, you want to retard. So it ends up making sort of a 3D-ish map of, you know, so it slopes uphill toward red line, and then it slopes downhill, right? So if you think of a think of a perfect uh, mound or whatever, cut into force, one of those mounds is about what the timing map's going to look like, a good timing map. Okay. So, the best way to do this is to start with a stock timing ratio, or stock timing map, to start with. If you're all motor, you're not really going to adjust it too much for your load changes. Okay, what you're looking at is fixing the holes in the factory timing map. Okay, now if you look at the stock timing map up here, which is not very easy for you guys to see, huh? If you, let's see if I can... I don't know how to make both of these screens show the same thing. They are they are in degrees. That is correct. Uh, I I can't figure it out. <laughs> Max is <laughs> But then that will make their web guys small. Except that I can't seem to. Okay, let me do something. You. It just gives me like a half a second to play with it, and then it goes away. See if I can try that. All right. So notice for your stock timing map, as your RPMs increase, your timing does not. Okay, so this is where your gains are for your factory timing map. Due to the fear of knuckleheads putting in bad gas and the whole nine yards, you know, the general knuckleheadery that exists with people, they just reached a maximum timing advance and then they left it alone. So as you get to about 6,000 RPMs or so, your timing does not advance at all. So for the, for the all motor guys, advancing timing from 6,000 and onward will give you an extra six or eight degrees of advance almost 10 degrees of advance that would allow you to keep pulling hard all the way to 9,000 RPM. So right now, if you look at a factory dyno, and I'll show you one here in a second, you'll see that it just sort of levels off right around 65, 7,000 RPMs. You can actually get that to keep climbing at a pretty rapid pace all the way to red line. Okay, so 
we start with our stock timing map if we're forced induction, okay? Now, we talked about uh, compression ratios, dynamic versus static, right? Static means it's just the compression ratio 10 to 1, right, versus 9 to 1. We talked about that a little bit. Well, even within the same engine, based on engine load, creates a dynamic compression ratio, right? At a 50% load, our 10 to 1 compression ratio engine is actually a 5 to 1 compression ratio engine, right? Because it doesn't have all the molecules in it that it would have at 100% load. At 150% load, right, it's a higher than dynamic compression, okay? So what you can do is if you look here, you have your... Yes, negative is retarded, which means the ignition occurs after top dead center. High positive numbers are advanced ignition that is occurring before top dead center. So a, a 30 means that the ignition event is occurring 30 degrees before top dead center. That was an online question. Sorry. So if you look here, okay, you got your compression ratio pressure ratio and then your pressure ratio at different levels of efficiency because we know nothing is 100% efficient correct so a compression ratio of 10 to 1 means at a top dead center you have a 22 to 1 pressure ratio that accounts for all the heating of the charge as it as it decreases okay at 80% efficiency it's a 27.5 degree pressure ratio Okay, so bear in mind, think about this, guys. Our 10 to 1 compression ratio at 80% efficiency is a 27.5. That's our engine right now, naturally aspirated. You run 14.7 pounds of boost, roughly, okay? A little bit, this isn't exact, but rough idea. And you're running a dynamic compression ratio of 20 to 1, right? You got two atmospheres in there being compressed in the same volume, okay? That pressure ratio is 56 to 1, and at 80% efficiency, it's 70 to 1. So you're going from a 27.5 pressure ratio to a 70 pressure ratio. That is a lot of extra heat in that engine, right? Which is good, is where all our power is coming from. But when you're talking about timing, you have to keep that in mind, that the more boost you add, exponentially increases the load on the engine. Even though it's 110% load, it's not really 110% load when you talk about timing. It's whatever that pressure ratio is. All right? So if you map it out, these lines here basically show you the, how quickly your pressure ratios climb as your load increases. And it's the same curve, it's just based on different levels of efficiency, okay? Now, we don't have any good way that I'm aware of to 100% know what the efficiency of your system is. We can look at the turbo efficiency on the efficiency map and get a rough idea, and you can look at your engine's volumetric efficiency table and get a pretty good idea of where you're sitting, right? But there's no hard and fast way to know. So I just personally use the 80% efficient rule because the peak of most turbo maps is right around 80. The volumetric efficiency table is in the mid to high 90s for most of it for our engine. So I just kind of shoot somewhere in the middle, okay, and then add a little bit of safety involved. If you're feeling less aggressive, you can just use a different efficiency ratio. If you want to be less aggressive, use 60. The more, the less efficient you make your system in your design, the more timing you'll have to take out of it. Okay. Like I said, pick the efficiency that you can afford. Um, you modify your higher load pressure ratios off of the stock table. Okay, you use that line of best fit to get the dynamic compression ratios at each level and boost. And then you can verify using a 3D modeling to help ensure things don't look too crazy. 
And what I mean by that is, okay, so here's my stock timing table. As my load goes from a 0.1, right, which is a very low load, up to 1.1 and 1.25, which are higher load, this is my boosted engine now, I use the dynamic compression ratio where it says dynamic compression plus efficiency, right, which gives me my 31.46. Everybody see that? Okay, so I use that off of my... Okay, so based on my pressure ratio at my 100% load mark, right, I then reduce my timing based on the percentage of the increase of the pressure ratio. Everybody tracking that? Everybody, you guys are still with me online there? Okay, good. So, because my pressure ratio is climbing by whatever percent, I don't know what it is off the top of my head, it climbed from 27 to 31, so extra 5 or 6%, something like that. I take my timing down 5 or 6%, and then so on and so on. And you replicate that all the way across your higher RPMs. So, on my left here is the Cobb access port timing map for lead ignition timing. On my right is my computer model timing map using the pressure ratios for those unknown areas in boost, right? And as you can see, they both look pretty much the same. So the modeling works pretty close. This allows you to have a good, safe timing map for a boosted engine that you're not going to have to worry about it's going to grenade on you all the time. This helps you account for the heat. So what would you be expecting to see if you were using a more than Say again? What would, you be, what would you expect to see in your graph if you were... There's something going on that makes it seem like... Or you were yeah, if, yeah, but things look... If you're worried that your your timing model didn't look well, didn't look good, what you would see is timing falling off a lot toward red line or timing just nose diving once you go into boost. Like you gotta pull the timing. But you don't have to pull a crazy amount of timing. You know, back in the day before we started doing computer modeling type stuff, the rule of thumb was two degrees of timing for every uh, one PSI of boost. It's like old F E style. I mean, that was like the rule of thumb everybody used, you know. So whatever I'm doing here is got to be more scientific than that. Yeah. So what you don't want to do is pull 15 or 20 degrees for every 10% more load. <coughs> so that's what I mean by having it look right. And it helps if you've seen a lot of these maps before um, online or whatever. It should just look similar to what mine looks like. RPMs increasing as you go toward red line, falling off into boost without getting crazy. Like, the slope of the line should not be drastically changing. All right. Any other questions on this slide? Okay. Now, you have your base timing map. Drive it around, everything is cool. That's going to be safe. Shouldn't have any issues with it, okay? Is that the best timing map in the world? No. Without those pressure-sensitive spark plug inducers, right, you're never going to know for sure where the peak of your compression cycle is, okay, or combustion cycle. Um, oh, Ryan, did I lose you? Oh, okay. All right, so... With our base map, if we want to get more specific, okay, the only real way to do it is you have to adjust either using exhaust gas temperature or a dyno. On a dyno, you can put on a load base dyno, right, which means you can hold the load and hold the RPM steady. Measure the power coming off the wheels. Advanced timing, remeasure. 
advanced timing remeasure. What's going to happen is, at a certain point, you will reach a peak power potential. Past the peak power potential, if you continue to advance timing, you'll start to get into a detonation situation, right? That will manifest itself, before it becomes detonation, it will manifest itself as a de decrease in horsepower. Okay? Because you're not doing wide open throttle, you're not driving crazy, right? You're just low dy dynoing. So if you really want to get crazy with the timing, you basically get on, the, get on there, advance till you reach the peak horsepower, right? Go a little over, you know, that's the peak, and then you back it off and then back it off another two or three degrees for safety. And you do that as many spots on your timing map as you can and do that inter, inter, interpolation thing I was telling you about to fill in the blanks. Okay, that's like pretty legit race car stuff because you're going to spend six or eight hours on the dyno. But if you want to do it, that's the way to do it. The other option is to... Uh, no, the short answer to your question, Ryan, is our knock sensor is useless. So if you had a piston engine, yes, you could use the NOx sensor to make this determination, but we don't. The, the other option is to use an uh, exhaust gas temperature because what happens is as you advance timing, your EGTs will drop because you're holding more of the combustion inside the combustion chamber. The more retarded your timing is, the higher your EGTs are still burning inside the exhaust manifold when it goes by the EGT sensor, right? So it's hot. As you advance, it cools it off. And again, until you get to that point where you start getting into the detonation threshold, then it'll start heating up again. So on a dyno, you look for the horsepower peak. Using your EGT, you look for the lowest EGT temperature. Right? So in either case, it's difficult. That's why I've been working so long on this math stuff, because the math I showed you, that's like phase one. Phase two is actually getting into all the other variables that affect timing. And if you have a piston motor, you can use the knock sensor as well. Advance your timing until your knock sensor starts going off, and then back it down a little bit. Um, using the question was how would you adjust the timing using just the cob? The only scientific way that I know to do it is the way that I just showed you how to do it without any feedback, without EGT or without a uh, dyno. Using the pressure ratios is the only scientific way that I'm aware of. From there, if you're feeling froggy and you want to advance it. That's on you, okay? But without some sort of outside sensor, I personally wouldn't feel comfortable advancing it. Okay, so that's the end of the timing one. Now, again, I have that timing uh, spreadsheet that I can farm to you guys. Um, for timing improvements to an NA motor, which I think everybody here is NA and most everybody. Is there anybody that's currently forced induction without a base map online? Okay, so here's your leading ignition main table. All right. Now, you'll see that your load base timing does a pretty good job of falling off as the load gets higher, right? So the shape of that curve is pretty good. Let me uh, do this. It might be easier for you guys to see. Okay. So this is the base timing map. Now, you notice as the load goes higher, right, from 0 0.13 up to 0 0.94, your timing does a pretty good job of falling off, right? The problem is... Look at your RPM base. What, tell me what's wrong with that picture. Look at that curve. Looks pretty good on this side. Right? Everybody's just, yeah, now look at the curve on the other side. Bang. 
So for NA, what you want to address is that area right there. This little area right here, high RPMs, higher loads, okay? So you come here and you'll see on this map right around the 60% uh, load range. Yeah. For, for this year, it's at 56. For your guys' older AFRs, there's one that's right around 60. And you just run, you'll see where it, it increases, increases, right? And then it starts to level out. So like 31, 31, 30, da, 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 da. Right here, you guys see this? Okay. So at about 5,500 RPMs, these are advancing, so I'm going to leave that one alone. But this, Okay, so at 6,000 RPMs right here, I'm going to add two more or one more degree. And then here, I'm going to add two degrees. And here, I'm going to add three degrees. Then four degrees. And then ten degrees. Yeah, I was going to get to that. Uh, they asked me that same question online. All right, so this now takes that, that fall off, right, and makes it not super aggressive. I mean, you could be more aggressive than I was if you wanted to. I like to start slow. So it takes that where it's coming down and brings it up to a slight incline, right? Um, without a dyno, I wouldn't necessarily go more than one degree for RPM band. If I had a dyno or an EGT sensor, um, then I would I would be much more aggressive with uh, an NA motor because you can be, you know. Now the split between the leading and trailing is between 13 and 15 degrees depending on where you are in the map. So the easiest way to do this is whatever changes you make on the leading ignition main, make the exact same changes on the trailing ignition main. So don't copy and paste or anything, but know where you started, right? Know that I started at 0.56 and 6,000 RPMs, right? And that I went up one degree per one. So then I can go to the trailing ignition main Go to five, six, and six thousand. One degree, two degrees. There you go. Okay. Um, you can de decrease the split if you would like. It does result in a little bit more power, but it greatly lowers your detonation threshold. Because what happens is the rear end of the rotor, right, as it has that sweeping motion, it ends up with a denser air fuel mixture by virtue of just the way the engine is moving. So there's more air and less fuel in the leading part. So when you ignite the leading plug and it starts to burn, it's going to burn relatively slowly in the, the linear mixture. And then as it gets into, as it moves toward the trailing rotor, the flame front, it's going to burn faster and faster, right? If you ignite the trailing too soon, those two flame fronts will meet, and it increases your likelihood of detonation. Is it a huge risk? Not a huge one, but it is a risk. However, if you ignite the trailing plug sooner, and the two, the, the less the split is, the more in sync that push is on the engine, right? The more in sync that that push is, the more net power you're going to gain. It's kind of like a, a safe maximum, I guess. I would personally, I don't think I would go any lower than 10. When you're talking about wide open throttle, high loads, I wouldn't go much more over 10. Or more, much less than 10, rather, I should say. Um, if you leave it, start with, with it at 15, advance the leading, see how it feels. 
you like the way it feels, leave it alone. If you don't like the way it feels, you know, you can monkey with it a little bit. But no amount of research that you four or five of us can do in this room is going to replicate what Mazda did with the van. They did some stuff wrong, but they did it wrong for a reason. It's rich for a reason to protect the catalytic converter. The, retarding, the timing is retarded for a reason to protect idiots or protect them from being sued by people that put in cheap gas and blow the motor up. So we can fix the, those things, but we always have to realize, oh, uh, yeah, I would start by reducing them together, in, or increasing timing together in sync. Then as a phase two, if you want to reduce the split, reduce it from 15 to no less than 10. But I would do it in small increments to make sure that I'm not having detonation. You have to adjust both leading and trailing together. So when you advance timing on the leading, you have to advance the timing at the same time by the same amount. Okay, so that covers timing. Um, there's some other... The RPM delta maps, these guys here, all right, what they do is when you step on the throttle and your RPM start to increase, right, rise over run, or if your RPMs are decreasing when you come off of the throttle, it will add a little bit of advance or retard to your timing to help smooth things out. I personally have found no benefit in changing them. Things are pretty smooth the way that they are. All right. If you go forced induction and you have a very small turbo, I would increase these a little bit. Because that exhaust gas will spin that turbo up with a quickness and you don't want to be driving home your timing, right? At the same time, this turbo is spinning up. You want the things to happen just a little bit smoother, a little bit slower than that, rather than shocking your system. But as it is, you're good. Ah, I'm sorry. Let me clarify. If you're adjusting the split, you're going to adjust the trailing table. You're going to advance the trailing timing. Leave the leading timing alone. That's just for split. Otherwise, you change them both exactly the same. Okay. All right. So once you've made those particular changes, then the last couple things that you can play with is you can go into your closed loop area, and you can either reduce these closed loop load tables here, meaning that you exit closed loop sooner, okay? For forced induction, you have to. If you hold it in closed loop too long, that again, that turbo will spool up, and by the time it lets go of closed loop and goes put you into open loop, you're probably already boosting, okay? If you're not and you're and naturally aspirated, you can reduce them if you want to be in open loop. Conversely, you can increase them if you want to stay in closed loop longer. Really, the biggest benefit of closed loop is, is self-correcting. So if you'd rather be in closed loop mode more often, you can increase them. When you're in closed loop, these are your targets right here. Okay. And these are in, uh, yeah, well, they're not really, they're like in reverse lambda, kind of weird. 
Because you see these 110s right here? That makes it richer, not leaner. So I think it's just some sort of modifier of the factory uh, target air table. Uh, Ryan asked what would happen if you made your entire RPM band closed loop and adjusted your closed loop down to 12 or 13 for NA. Good question, Ryan. Matter of fact, we I talked to uh, Mark, one of the guys that I'm tuning. Uh, he's uh, one of the autocross drivers. Uh, what was he on? Monitor Motorsport or something like that? He's a competitive autocross guy. He asked me the same question, of which I did not have a good answer for him. So I built him two maps one closed loop and one open loop, and he's going to experiment with it this weekend while he's racing. So, you may be a genius before your time, Ryan, or you may be a bad idea. I will let you know when I get feedback from Mark to see how it does. But in theory, if your targets, if your sensors are scaled, if everything is absolutely correct and you're hitting your target like clockwork, in theory, you should be able to set the entire car to closed loop because you should never be so far off that you have to worry about it. The reason why you leave closed loop is to prevent your car from, prevent it from being so far off of the target based on all these little corrections that it's making that it puts you into a dangerous territory. But if you know for a fact you're hitting your target all the time, really there should not be any danger in leaving it in closed loop. It just hasn't been really done before that I'm aware of. So I'm playing with it this weekend. I'll let you guys know how it goes. I think I just answered your question, Ryan. And you are correct. It's the amount of time it has to keep up with the corrections. But what I'm saying is if you, if you do your work as a tuner and you know that you're hitting your targets, there shouldn't be huge corrections that the factory computer has to make. And therefore, you should be able to run in closed loop pretty much all the time. Rather than actually making the adjustments. It's both ends. Because if it gets lags on the calculations, you're not going to get your target. It'll be behind you. But if you're already going to get your target, then all the little small changes, you know, just, just small little changes should be okay. Like I said, well, I'm experimenting with it. I'll let you guys know when, uh, when I find out. Um, okay, so there's that. The... If you guys change your injectors, not get them reflowed, but actually change them itself, <coughs> you will have to adjust your uh, injector latency, which are these guys right here. That is an enormous pain in the butt. I do not recommend buying injectors that are of a different latency than the factory ones. Because you only get two latency tables. You got it. So you get too crazy with it, and you've only got one table that's trying to adjust the latency of four uh, right. Uncapped latency should be the same. Because it's it's physically the same injector. It's just been uncapped. I'm talking about going and getting some of those RC engineering uh, injectors, you know, the big fat barrel ones. I've had nothing but nightmares with trying to tune around them. Even with the latency flow chart, I haven't had any luck with it. So, your results may vary. But that's my that's my recommendation. Uh, you can ignore all the knock retard tables. They don't do anything anyway. <coughs> okay, so let's talk about some of the tables that we briefly covered before. This calculated load max table, remember I told you that's the reality check when it calculates load. So it's going to calculate the load based on the mass airflow, bounce off of this, right, and either keep the load that it calculated or it'll reduce it to whatever this max load table is. Okay? Guess what you want to do if you've got forced induction? Got to raise it up. Otherwise, you can leave it be. Okay, and then here's those compensator tables I was telling you about. See these guys here? One's for intake temperature sensor and one's for barometric pressure. 
if you're, I wouldn't mess with them, but what I would do if I was like a regular ready type of forced induction system, remember, as we lower load, what do we do to our fueling? More or less fuel? Less fuel, right? And what do we do in the timing? More timing or less timing? More timing, right? Load goes down, more timing. We advance the timing as the load decreases, right? Or we retard it as the load goes up. Okay, so picture this. You're in a turbocharged vehicle. The intake temperature sensor is 140 degrees Fahrenheit. If you follow this map as is, it's going to reduce your total load calculation, which will give you more, less fuel and more timing. Is that what a turbocharged car needs when it's 140 degrees in the intake track? Probably not, because that fuel, it needs more fuel to keep it cooler, right, because you're compressing the air. So what I do is on these here, I will put them back up to one. Okay, basically instead of having a straight downward slope, I kind of bring it back up. And it's just for safety purposes. If my intake air gets that hot, I want extra fuel. I don't want fuel coming out of there. So I want to over-report my load. Even though the air is not as dense, I understand, I logically understand why the load is going down. We just want to add more fuel anyway for safety. Yep, exactly. All right, if you want to increase your uh, rev limit, there you go. Knock yourself out. I did, uh, for Marks, the racing guy, we gave him a 9,600 RPM red line. Even though there's no power up there, what it does allow him to do is stay in the same gear longer when he's doing autocross. So the time saved by not having to shift at the top end of third is worth it. So if you're in something like that where shifting is your drawback, then increase the red line. Otherwise, unless you've got some crazy porting going on, it's not really worth it. <laughs> All right. Now for your oil metering, I do not adjust the throttle based. Leave that one alone, but I adjust the load-based OMP, right? I want to add about 10% more oil at a minimum across the board. I want what our engines die from, lack of lubrication, right? I would even go so far as to say if you can go higher than 10, go higher than 10. The only drawback to over-oiling your engine, with the exception of having to put more oil in your car, is you'll get smoke out the back, black smoke. So as a general rule, continue to advance your OMP levels until you get black smoke out of the back, and then back it off a little bit. You don't want it to smoke at idle. But I would start with a 10 percenter for sure. And I also lower these fans. 207 is way too high. Oh, yeah, what you do is you click on this first cell right here. I guess I should show you guys. Sorry. Hold it down, right? Hide the whole thing. Press the M key for multiply and type in 1.10. And that will raise it. The other option. Oh, you can if you'd like to. I personally don't have any problem with the shape of the curve that's already there. I just want it higher. But if you want to change the shape of the curve and add more oil, by all means. Yeah. I remember a discussion on the Jeep Club that after 60, it can't go any higher. I remember that as well. Yeah, so it's a step on the I can't remember who said it. There was apparently there was some testing done, but it was basically that. It is a stepper motor, so it will only go as open as it will go. What I don't know 
And this goes back to the same argument with the dwell. If Mazda didn't call me and tell me if this three refers to three teeth on the motor right. or three degrees of rotation or three butterflies crossing a field, I don't know. So I just, when I don't know what something is specifically, I make a change based on the percent of what I want. That's my personal technique. Um, but you do lower these fans. I lower this guy to 190, this fan number one here. I lower this guy to 200. And I put this guy at 205. And what that is is one fan on, right? Both fans on low speed, both fans on high speed. So I, I want to make sure that at 190 degrees, I got one fan going. At 200 degrees, I got both fans going. And at 205, I want both going high, full speed. Our car is running warm enough as it is. I don't really want to make it any worse. Um, you will have your fans running more often when the car is off. Like you'll stop it, turn the car off, and you'll hear it for a while. But engines are expensive. Batteries are less expensive. <laughs> and just let it run. And it only runs usually for about 30 seconds at the most. Um, but that you've had yours run for five minutes before. Dang. Yeah, I guess if you're driving to Arizona, you're right. It might run more often. Okay, so the last section we're going to talk about is your uh, your APV, SSV, and VDI right here. These are where these tables are at. This just addresses when they open. And this, uh, the anything that says hy hysteresis, which I'm not sure I'm not pronouncing that right. What's that? Hysteresis? Yeah, I, I, don't, I know what it means. I don't know how to pronounce it. I don't speak English. Uh, it's when it turns off. So it turns on, in this case, the APV turns on at 6,250 RPMs, and it will turn itself back off again. It will close when it falls 188 RPMs below where it activated. That's how that works. Okay. Um, again, all motor, I wouldn't mess with. Forced induction with something kind of, you know, in the 250 horsepower range, wouldn't mess with it. You start getting closer to the 300 horsepower range, look at your dyno plots, look at your airflow plots. If you see a lot of this stuff going on, maybe start trying to mess with it. Okay. Um, as far as timing goes, I'm just going to show you guys this real quick. This is to show you what a before and after dyno with timing changes, all right? And I specifically want you guys to look at this area right here. You can see in the before, right, at the tail, at the top end of the RPM range, it's just falling right off, right? Afterward, it still eventually falls off based at the very high RPM, but it's still pulling ahead all the way up to red line. So that's where those timing changes can, can save you. But if you notice that overall, a more aggressive timing map doesn't make a huge, huge difference. It makes a little bit of a difference, but not a huge one. But getting rid of those rich AFRs and getting your timing right will give you back that top end at a much better level than what it is right now. All right, where are we at? Okay, so we covered everything. At this point, if anyone has any questions, I will go ahead and answer them. And what time is it, guys? I don't watch that. 3.58. Okay, so let's do question and answer. And uh, we'll do some, some sample hands-on for a little bit. Uh, but all of the heavy hands-on is going to be for tomorrow. That's the specific. We're going to do your engine, your idle. Um, who do I have that uh, for tomorrow, online only? If you if you signed up for online tomorrow, just add it into the chat so I know how many I got. 
Uh, I don't have any personal experience with a virtual dyno. I don't even know what that is. I Anything virtual, all right, is reading off of the mass airflow sensor. 100% guarantee you. Unless it has an accelerometer built into it, in which case it's reading off of the accelerometer and the, the inputted weight that you put into the car. So if you're not, uh, if you're using any kind of virtual dyno for horsepower thing, they're just doing the same thing I showed you guys how to do with that mass, the mass flow rate, all that kind of stuff, and then it figures out the horsepower. What's the kind of theoretical maximum of say the gritty? Base gritty. Base gritty with the factory snail is safe. Street power, I would say 275 at the wheels. Somewhere right around there. Um, anything past that, and you really start to stretch that turbo outside of its comfort zone. What PSI is that 275 at? would be probably 11. What's going to happen is it's going to fall off. So you probably, you can set it up with a boost controller. You can get it to hold 11 for a while. Past about 6,000 RPM, it's just going to fall off no matter what you do. Um, something like a 3071 or the BNR upgrade, yeah. you should be able to hold 10, 11, maybe 12 PSI all the way to red line. On a 3071 or 3076, I should say, um, I held 14 all the way to red line with appropriate boost controller changes. That's just a. You send a turbo away for basically a compressor upgrade? Uh, the BNR one you do. Yeah, you send him your Dreddy, and he does uh, oil and water cooled. Remember, the Dreddy has journal bearings, so it, it'll die within a couple thousand miles, of, well, maybe 10,000 miles of driving it. And he replaces all that stuff and puts a different clipped AR on it and a different clipped uh, compressor. I'm not exactly sure what they are off the top of my head, though. All right, uh, you upload your logs, computes, diagraph. Yeah, like I said, the uh, the vert anything virtual is measuring based on known vehicle weight, based on known. Assuming your calibrations are good and your all that kind of stuff, it's going to give you a graph that looks strikingly familiar to your graph of your mass flow rate. If you just do a simple graph of your uh, mass airflow grams per second column on a wide open throttle log, it's going to look identical to that virtual dyno. It's just not going to say horsepower on it. You guys, you guys know what I'm saying, Ryan? I guess they, they're off. Okay. So, any other questions? Uh, so, what would you like, like if you just want to start from scratch, you, you went through scaling. Did you always start with scaling, or is there aspects of timing that you might incorporate before you start your I always start with scaling, unless I have a force induction. If you have force induction, you have to use a base map that you build from scratch that covers the uh, boosted portions. Basically, you don't have to, but anything past idle and you run the risk of detonation on your engine. Uh, okay, so... But when you act the actual tuning process, you want to stay in NA land, if at all possible, to do all of your scaling of your sensors. What about Dwell? Is that just a plug-in? Dwell is just a plug-in. Like I said, I, as a non-electrical engineer, I gave you know my theory on what the Dwell should be, or Micron, or whoever it is. The, the, Someone posted an Excel. Right. They did a bunch of back-end math and whatever and came up with their own version of how that's represented for milliseconds and how to change it. it. I don't know the guy. I don't know what exactly he did, so I can't say that he's right and I'm wrong or vice versa. All I can explain is where I came up with my information and, you know, 
you have to kind of judge that one for yourself. But I do know for a fact in this, in this service manual it says 3.5 milliseconds to dwell is how they test coils at the uh, dealership for the RXC. And Oh, that would be something you can do beforehand if you know for a fact that you. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, all right, question here. Is it possible to hit the higher voltages during cruise logging just by using high RPM? Yes, you will hit some of the higher voltages during cruise logging. You won't hit all of them, but when you're cruising at 8,500 RPM, you'll be fairly high up in the voltage chain, if you will. Any other questions from you guys? The, uh, the Gretti Turbo Kit package, I thought I heard something about it has like this e management system that plugs into the computer or what? Yeah, the e. sort of helps to adjust a bunch of the stuff if you are creating your own maps and whatnot. It's. The short answer is it's a terrible idea. <laughs> the e manage. The question was for the online guys uh, about the e manage for the Gretti Turbo Kit. Uh, it What it does is it intercepts the factory signals and then modifies them. So if you wanted to double your, or let's say you wanted to add 25% more fuel, you would tell it to increase this pulse length by 50%. So whatever it was, add 50%, which is the net effect of 25%, right? Because it's a percentage of a percentage. But it's a lot of shooting in the dark. Is really what it boils down to. And all the fuel trims and stuff, that the factory uh, system uses will end up undoing a lot of what you do in the Gretti. And B, the Gretti E-Manage is a map pressure-based system, whereas the RX-8 is a mass airflow-based system. So the two don't really talk nice to each other. It's not as simple as I want this many milliseconds of duration at this uh, PSI because sometimes the mass airflow sensor will read it one way, Sometimes it'll read it the other way. So the calculated load is always going to be hit or miss. So it causes a lot of issues. It's just not worth using. So they on older cars. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, Ryan, that is correct. That's what the image was causing nightmares because people were having their changes undone and then blowing up the engine. Now, I have heard good things about the electronic. My understanding of the electronic is that it intercepts those signals and then, for the most part, it produces its own mass for all the electronics and then back feeds information to the factory you see. Yeah. A system that's able to do that, which if the electronic is successfully able to do that, is fine. I mean, there's nothing inherently wrong with it. You're not going to have the level of adjustability that a flash tool will give you. Anything standalone is typically going to be less adjustable, simply because no, no manufacturer that's not Mazda or Subaru is going to be, take the time to build in all of those relationships and maps and stuff. Because um, they build a vehicle that has to run in every corner of the earth 99.99% of the time, right? If computers, if cars had a 1% failure rate, nobody would buy them. If one, one or two days out of the year it just didn't work, like from the factory, you nobody would buy them, right? So their failure rate is very, very low, and they spend a lot of time and money making it that way. So we're, whenever I get into standalone issues, or whenever I get into standalone then it's because your vehicle either doesn't have a flash ability, period, or is so heavily modified for a purpose like racing or whatnot that 
you simply can't play in in the the Flash tool world. Uh, yeah. Oh, thank you for reminding me. I didn't even cover it. The acceleration maps are right here. Throttle fuel gear. You guys will have two or three rather if you're below 2007 or six. And I've only got the two. Uh, those are for throttle tip in. I didn't even cover it at all, so my bad. When you first step on the gas, and any whether you're closed loop or open loop, whatever, it doesn't matter. But when you first step on the gas, it takes a second. The air that's in the intake will rush in to fill the void from the throttle plate opening before everything catches up. Right, so it'll lean out. You'll always have some kind of a lean spot. A throttle uh, used to be an accelerator pump back in the carburetor days. The accelerator tables just sort of blindly dump in a certain amount of fuel to counter that when you step on the throttle. So if you find yourself with lean spots when you get on the gas, you want to adjust it in your throttle fuel table. If you're all motor with a factory intake and factory throttle body, you shouldn't really ever have issues with it. I've seen it on... Force and induction cars, absolutely. Have to change it. On uh, ported throttle body cars, then you have to change it because the, the amount of air that gets rushed in is a little bit more, and you'll have uh, more of a lean spot. Did that answer your question, Jay Cundy? Yeah, I'll just talk. It's a bit easier than typing. But um, I noticed that we've got, when we get the throttle positions uh, are getting higher, like 84%, um, it's got uh, some AFRs about 14.7, sorry, uh, above the 3.5 RPM range. I was thinking that maybe that should be lower, like the target AFRs we're trying to get to. Uh yeah, you're you are correct. Provided, um, and this is of course the factory map right here. Uh, his question was at like 4,000 RPMs up there at 84% throttle. The target is 14.7. Right? Do we want it to be uh, different than that? You might remember this is this these maps here. They don't have any feedback to them. So even though it looks like it's saying 14.7, what it's really saying is this much fuel to add, right? So because there's no feedback loop built in, you just don't want to go in there and say, well, I want 13.5 and I'm going to get it. You got to log it. You got to look at where your logs are. And if you see a lean spot, which will, you know, you can literally look at that graph of the AFRs and see it go whoop and then back down, go find out what RPM that lean spot occurs and what your throttle position is and go in here and modify it. You shouldn't need to do it first. Right, so that's just an arbitrary value, it's not an AFR value. Correct, it's represented in AFRs, but remember like the target air fuel tables, it's the same thing. The computer is doing the math to convert AFR into injector duration is doing the same thing here. It's just being displayed to you as an AFR. There's no feedback loop. There's no way for you to know you're going to get a 14.7 or an 11.7. Got it. Um, one other thing that I found, um, it took me a little while to pick up on the forum because not many people seem to uh, articulate it very well, is that when you're doing your tuning, a lot of people don't bother to um, get the uh, fuel scaling just right and the mass scaling just right and they just tune their fueling tables only so they end up with uh, sort of arbitrary values in their uh, target AFR tables just to get the uh, real world correct measured AFRs that they're gunning for so I just, I, yes, I just that wanted to make that clear to everyone now so I've just like I had an epiphany the other day and I was like ah oh, shit that's why uh, half the threads say do it this way and the other half say do it sort of Kane's way <laughs> yeah I uh I get blamed a lot because again I'm anal retentive and everyone's like well what does it even matter 
Maybe it doesn't. I'm perfectly willing to accept the fact that I'm wrong. He's talking about changing the target AFR table instead of changing all your sensors. However, I look at it like if I change my sensors and I hit one of those, where I hit enough of those target AFR tables correctly, and my deviation is very low across the board, then I know I'm pretty good. If I want to lean my, my fuel out, I just go in there and lean it all out. If I want to enrich it up, I go in there and enrich it up. If you change the fuel tables and you don't change your sensors first, um, the issues that come into play are you don't really know how it's going to respond in third gear. You had it, you thought you had it dialed in in second gear, right? Because that's the ch table that you changed. Now in third gear, you can do whatever. You have no idea, right? There's no predictability. You change your air intake, no predictability. You don't have any idea what you're going to have to change. If I change, my, if I get my tune right and I change my air intake, guess what I'm changing? Mass air flows. That's it. I know for a fact that's what's going to be different. Uh, all right, Ryan's taking off. Cool. Um, any other questions? Nope. Pretty good. Okay. A. Hey, uh, you like, how you got online? Everybody that's online, um, if you want to go ahead and we'll just, we got a little bit of time. Everyone take one idle log and let's pull them up and look at them and we'll make a little bit of an adjustment and then that'll be our, our hands on for the day. And then we'll deal with you three plus uh, who else is going to be here tomorrow for the hands on with your engine? For my online peoples. Okay, so Isaac said he might be here. All right, if you uh, if you want to play tomorrow and do all the hands-on stuff uh, with your specific engine, uh, just make sure that you've. Uh, paid for the day two and go ahead everybody before we call it a day let's go get everybody get one idle log and then let's look at them collectively as a group and we'll see where everybody's sitting with their uh, mass airflow sensor and their fuel trims um, if you don't have the ability to take engine logs I guess just hang tight this should take about 10 minutes or so and then uh, we'll be able to Share them on the screen a little bit. Uh, when you log, go ahead and check every data block. There's no reason not to, right? They always talk about the speed of the resolution, which is a valid point, except that we're logging solid state engine data. You see, what I mean, if it's whether it's a half a second between each data record or a third of a second, it doesn't really matter because you're going to get 30, 40 seconds of the same thing. We're looking for averages. So log it all, that way we can see. Sometimes, like I caught somebody uh, had low voltage on their alternator. So their alternator was getting ready to go bad on them. And we just happened to catch it while doing idle logs. So you never know what you're going to see. Did that answer your question, Isaac? Sorry, I think I'm having a really bad audio issue. Can you try that again? Sure. Uh, go ahead and log everything. Turn on all of the data parameters because you're logging solid state engine data, right? So all of the data is going to be roughly the same. So we don't really need high resolution. But having all of the things checked allows us to troubleshoot for weird stuff. Like I caught a guy with a uh, bad alternator by doing his idle logs because I saw that his voltage was low. Would have never caught it if we didn't log it. Okay, and is that just a default, or do I have to manually go in there and um, adjust it? No, you'll have to manually go in and, and check all the blocks on okay. the job. Okay. I came in here with zero knowledge, so I uh, appreciate right. you bearing with me. Oh, not a problem. That's the whole point of learning, right? Everybody, uh, 
hopefully you don't have any questions left on the table. I know that it's like drinking from the fire hose on day one, but if you get some hands on, it starts to make a lot more sense. Okay, I've got one more question about logging. Um, yeah. Uh, I was just looking uh, at the best method to actually do a log, and on the um, Mazda Maniac uh, instructions, he had uh, do a uh, engine cycle, uh, as in warm the car up with the new flash, and then let it cool down completely, and then let it warm up again uh, the next day, for example, and then do your logs after that. Is there a particular reason to do that, like to let the uh, long term fuel trims um, get sorted out? Yep, that's what it's for, is to let the long-term fuel trim settle. Uh, if you're impatient like me and you're willing to do a little bit of extra math, you don't have to wait because you can just take the short-term and long-term and put them together. Um, in the case of Jeff, you know, he's got so many customers and so many tunes that he just look wants to look at one column instead of looking at a bunch of different columns, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's cool. I also have one more question. Right. Um, so I currently have the Cobb Stage 1 on. Do I need to go back to stock? Yes, please. The Stage 1 tune is okay. garbage. <laughs> uh, yes, and you'll want it to be fully warmed up before you log it. All right, anybody that's got a bail, go ahead and bail. Uh, anyone that wants to grab a log... Go ahead and grab a log, and uh, I'm going to step outside and take five myself. Thanks, Kane. It's been very useful. Thanks, Kane. It's been very useful. Not a problem. I said, I'll, I'll be back. I'm just going to take a break because my uh, back is killing me. This stupid office chair sucks. <laughs>
All right. Does anybody uh, have a log yet? All right. Let's try. All right, when, uh, we're going to try to play around here. What I'd like to see is if, I think I can do it, where uh, whoever wants to go, I can give them their screen, and then they can sort of walk us through what they're doing, and we can all kind of watch. Yeah, the rotary has a certain uh, aroma. What do you have to update anything? Yeah. All right, Isaac, I'm going to try to make you into the presenter, and we'll see.